Joel Toff with Nephrology Times here. Very excited to be with Dr. Barrett. Dr. Barrett is is the man of the hour presenting studies all over the place on ICANN. It is the disease that we seem to be focusing most on. It is the world's most important kidney disease. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Just look at the poster sessions. <laughs> look at the late-breaking trials. It's all over the place. And uh, you have two late-breaking trials. Uh, let's start with Ateracept. Now, what, what is this drug? So Ataricept is a Ataricept. dual BAF and April inhibitor. Okay. Uh, and these are two key cytokines that drive B cell and plasma cell proliferation and differentiation. Yep. And are really essential to produce immunoglobulins. And of course, IgA nephropathy is a disease of pathogenic IgA. Now, are we seeing these drugs using in any other disease states? I mean, we have B cell diseases all over the place. Yeah. So, in terms of April inhibition, mm -hmm. and combined April and BAF inhibition, there really isn't anything out there. But of course, we gotcha. do have a BAF inhibitor yes. that's be used and approved for the treatment of lupus nephritis. But that's a, a BAF only. Only drug. We don't have any drugs available at the moment to treat uh, any form of kidney disease, which incorporates both a, an ability to block BAF and April. Okay, so this prevents maturation and survival of these B cells. Absolutely, and the data is very clear that it leads to reductions in immunoglobulin levels, and in particular, reduction in the pathogenic form of IgA, the GDIGA1 that we think is responsible for the kidney disease. And, and so that, that's better than just wiping them out with a drug like uh, rituximab? So rituximab doesn't work, interestingly. So there's been a trial of rituximab in IgA and yep. here in the States, mm -hmm. and CD20 depletion did not impact on those pathogenic forms of IgA or clinical outcomes. And that really likely speaks to the fact that this disease is driven by B cells and plasma cells in different microenvironments than we traditionally associate with autoimmune disease. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so, uh, and so there's two-year data here. What, what do we find? Well, we find something really unprecedented. Actually, in, I'm, I want to actually rewind a little bit. Yep. Let's, let's talk about who was enrolled in this trial. What, what kind of patients are, are, are we seeing in this trial? So uh, this trial included patients with IgA nephropathy, yep. biopsy proven, yep. at high risk of progressive disease. So okay. significant levels of proteinuria, mm -hmm. despite optimized RAS blockade, with mm -hmm. a preserved GFR of above 30. So, okay, so very similar to the studies that we've seen published absolutely. over and over again. This is kind of the same menu, kind of the same. Okay, okay. so and we, this is two-year data? Two-year data, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what we see is really an unprecedented stabilization of GFR over a full two-year period, despite this being in a group of high-risk patients. So what we're seeing is a loss of kidney function over that two-year period that is equivalent to physiological aging of the kidneys in healthy individuals. A couple of, a couple of milliliters well, per minute. Well, 0.6 mils per minute per year. So, you know, and we think over the age of 40 people, you lose around one mil per minute per year of kidney yeah, function. Yeah, 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 so, just for your birthday. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. So really, things that we didn't think were going to be possible, particularly in a high-risk group of patients. Interesting. And w w any, any safety signal here? No, no. I mean, this, this drug does impact on total immunoglobulin levels, mm -hmm. but nothing in terms of significant infection yeah, risk that we saw, yeah. but and, and really a well-tolerated treatment. So this was an open-label extension, so it was an offer to patients, mm -hmm. and overwhelmingly, over 90% of patients completed the two-year study with self-injections at home, mm -hmm. sub-Q injections once a week, and they were able to tolerate that, it was acceptable, and they went all the way through to the end of the study. So this was a phase two trial. So are you guys starting a phase three or not? The phase three's already started. It's so, already started. So we've already recruited the number of patients we need for the proteinuria endpoint. So with this time next year, we will be talking about proteinuria. the impact from yep. on proteinuria from the phase three global study. So that's why this data is so exciting because mm -hmm. it's not gonna take as long to wait to see the impact started. on proteinuria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. excellent. Excellent. Um, anything else to say about that drug? Uh, well, what happens after the two years? Are these they, Presumably they have to stay on this drug? Well, uh, the two years is the end of the study. Yeah, I understand. So, um, so that will be the end of the data that we collect. In the, in the phase three study, what is really rewarding is that the sponsor has agreed to keep the drug accessible to those patients until the drug is available in that particular country. So the patient commits to a two-year trial yep. but yeah. actually they get access to the drug longer than that but much longer than that until they can actually get it as part of their routine clinical care assuming it's safe and effective and yeah but, they're, they're but, but you know that's like, really that's right. important because we this is a global study mm -hmm. and we recruit patients in countries that traditionally have not been able to access these types of drug from yeah. an affordability point of view. So yep. it's really important that those patients feel supported to contribute to a clinical not trial supported and, and have access yeah. to the drug at the end of the study. That's excellent.
So we have the the, the anti CD38 drug. This is the monoclonal antibody. That's right, felsartamab. Felsartamab. Yep. I think I could pronounce that. Took me about six months to be able to get it <laughs> like that. that. That's what it takes to become PI. I think, <laughs> well, I think the, the names they're giving drugs now, it takes you at least six months to get it to come off as if it sounds naturally. <laughs> well done. Well played. So, and, and so, and what, what's the rule for this? This is a phase two trial also. That you Again, it's about. a phase two trial. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, this trial did not look at different doses. It looked at different dosing regimes. Okay. So the same dose was used, but actually what we had was comparing nine doses to five doses to three doses okay uh, uh, over a six-month period uh, okay. at the same dose for each uh, administration so it's a frequency of the kind of an issue absolutely okay. yeah for six uh, months and this is a cd38 depleter okay so commonly these drugs are actually used to treat multiple myeloma mm -hmm. so daratumumab and uh, uh, and other drugs like that so this is designed to deplete plasma cells. And the reason we're looking here is because the CD20 depletion with rituximab just Didn't doesn't work. work. So right. we're looking at a right. different uh, subset of the B-cell lineage, so the antibody secreting yep. cells, to see whether this does indeed work. And the data for this trial, the early data for this trial was presented at the European meeting early this year. Uh -huh. What I'm presenting is the total data set okay. for a two-year follow-up. So six months treatment, 18 months off treatment, and okay. then follow-up. Okay. And what did you find? So what we find is a sustainable reduction in IgA, sustainable reduction in the GDIGA1 okay. that we think is yep. pathogenic, yep. and we find that we see sustainable reductions in proteinuria, and we see stability of GFR over the two-year period. So these people stop the drug after six months, after six and months. 18 months later you're still seeing the biological effect? So, absolutely. And do you have any idea how long that will last at this well, point? Well, so we only have two-year data. Yeah, so, so as far, right now it's, it seems yeah, it's I mean, right we, to the end of the page. Yeah, absolutely, but, w but when we look at the immunoglobulin levels, they are starting to creep back up. Sure. So I don't think a single course of treatment, a nine treatment course, is going to be curative, and patients are never going to need treatment again, I think. Yeah. But there's clearly a prolonged period of time off treatment where they are seeing clinical benefit. Okay. Any safety signal here? Not at all, no. I mean, again, you know, it's a depletion strategy, so we do see reductions in other immunoglobulins, yep. Yep. but nothing in terms of an infection signal, which is the obvious thing that we're worried about. Okay. So the thing that is on every nephrologist's mind as we gain more and more tools, people are more and more confused. So let's fast forward and like everything works out to your dreams and all of these drugs become approved. How are we gonna organize how we use these? What patients, what do you think is the, what, what is gonna be the patient that's perfect for uh, this anti-CD38 drug? What is that gonna look like? So what you'll see in the draft guidelines of the KDGO update that we've yeah. done is we're yep. trying to start that process mm -hmm. and we're starting to say if you've got IJ nephropathy, think about the immunological aspect of the disease and think about the CKD aspect of the disease. So start off at the high level. So you, if you're coming to see me with a GFR of 50 with established CKD, I'm absolutely going to need to think about RAS inhibitors. Mm -hmm. I might think about endothelium receptor antagonists, SGLT2 inhibitors. Because you're an established CKD. Because you've got an established CKD, gotcha. just as if they were diabetic, just as if they had sure. any form of kidney disease. Sure. But at the same time, now we have these new toys to play with. Think about the immunology and treat that. Disease modifying therapy. Absolutely. So then we're going to have choices in terms of B-cell directed therapies. We now have complement inhibitors. And we really are as clear in our own minds at the moment as to how we might think about which drug is better for which person and what what combination therapy we might need. Do we need to have a CD38 with a complement inhibitor? So I, I just want to interrupt just a bit. You mentioned complement hi inhibitors as disease modifying and maybe I'm just being simple to this but this seems like it's very late in the process and that just feels almost like suppressing some of the damage but not really modifying the disease. It seems almost like at the very end of the whip. No, Am I thinking about it wrong? No, you're absolutely thinking about it right and mm -hmm. I think we we draw a parallel with how we treat class 3, class 4 lupus mm -hmm. or ankyovasculitis. We mm -hmm. give a rituximab, mycophenolate, cyclic phosphamide mm -hmm. to target the production of pathogenic antibody and we always combine that with an immediately acting anti-inflammatory agent like a steroid or a vacapan mm -hmm. to treat the inflammation and the damage in the here and now. Yeah. So that's how I see this evolving in IgA nephropathy. We give a therapy that targets the production of pathogenic IgA yep. and in those patients with significant inflammation and there may not be that many. In my practice I don't see that much because mine are mainly Europeans, uh, white ancestry. If uh -huh. I had a big Chinese population I would look something completely different. There I'm thinking do I need to add on an a short burst of a significant anti-inflammatory agent 
to quell that inflammation while I'm waiting for that B-cell-directed therapy.